Okay, uh, so welcome everybody to today's second block of plenary talks. Uh, this time we have two keynotes in interaction. That is an exciting opportunities for both getting acquainted with their groundbreaking work and on the cutting edge of research development, but also a possibility of putting them into communication, having those two bright minds uh, talking to each other is a, a added value to, 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 the, to, to having uh, keynotes for the conference. So the program for today is first we have Aaron's keynote and then we have Michael's keynote, each of them one hour, and then we have one hour for panel discussion in a dialogue plus uh, uh, public uh, questions as well. So the title that I put preliminary for this event is Cognition and Intelligence as Species Specific, Their Origins and Manifestations. So this keynote dialogue addresses computation as morphogenesis, the origin and development of morphological characteristics such as shape, form, and material composition in material bodies on different levels of organization. So we have morphogenesis on physical, chemical, biological, cognitive, and virtual machine computation built in on top of them. And we will hear in keynote talks given by two of the most original and creative researchers within the field. Aaron Sloman and Michael Levin. This is indeed a meeting of two extraordinary minds with clear scientific agenda deeply rooted in philosophical understanding and transcending boundaries of variety of knowledge domains and practical applications. To mention but a few research fields involved, computing, biology, chemistry, physics, cognitive science, intelligence science with both biological and artificial intelligence, robotics, medicine, philosophy, and more. Aaron Sloman and Michael Levin are opening new research avenues and anticipating uh, coming developments with relevance for multiple knowledge communities and practical applications. So I, I wrote a long, uh, much longer introduction. That's a shorter version, just to to uh, to, to set a stage for for the meeting of uh, Aaron and Michael. Now the first keynote talk will be given by Aaron Sloman, honorary professor of AI and cognitive science at the School of Computer Science, University of Birmingham, UK. Last year. Aaron Sloman was awarded a 2020 Barwise Prize, which recognizes significant and sustained contributions to areas relevant to philosophy and computing by uh, APA. So he has published widely on philosophy of mathematics, epistemology, cognitive science, and artificial intelligence and collaborated interdisciplinary, among others, with biologists on evolution of intelligence. He is, for me, an embodiment of Renaissance mind, uh, fearlessly exploring different facets of uh, computing, cognition, intelligence, asking new questions and proposing new conceptualizations, such as, for example, metamorphogenesis. He is the first AI researcher to apply the con concept of information processing to human and AI minds. He proposed evolvable virtual machine information processing architectures and much more. In, in the, uh, the chat, I will post several links uh, that, and I encourage you to visit for more information, both uh, 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 Aaron's uh, web page and also some more links uh, for you to explore after the talk. The title of the talk today is Why Don't 
hatching alligator eggs ever produce chicks? Please, Aaron, the floor is yours. You're muted, Aaron. You're muted. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for your kind words. I'm the world's most chaotic Zoom user. And um, I'm going to post in the chat panel a um, URL, which is there now. Oh, and you've got some off there. Anyway, mine is uh, a web page that I will actually be using in a minute when I go into shared screen. And I'll go from that in various directions, which may or may not work um, uh, with demos. Um, but everything I want to say can later be got from that in one way or another. So uh, you can leave it for now. Um, I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity. I, I didn't know about Mike's work until very recently. In fact, a former externally supervised PhD student who's connected here, uh, Aviv Karen, was the first person who mentioned Mike to me. So uh, that, that turned out to be a very useful uh, link. Now, I'm going to try to share my screen. And I can't yet see. Oh, yes, there's a share screen button. And I will have permission to do that, I presume. So I'm clicking on it. What's going on? Nothing. Try again. Uh, nothing. Why can't I share my screen? It's the first time. There's a green uh, button at the uh, middle bottom. That's the one I'm clicking on. I wonder if it's trying to do something that I've missed because I have so much stuff on the screen. I'll try again. Nope. It says Pardon try. Me, but you have to select uh, the, the file you are sharing. When you have your presentation already open, then Zoom gives the option to choose it for the sharing. Um, well, I have a web page that I'm going to go to, which I'm now looking at, and I'll go to that when Zoom uh, opens. And that's what I've done in the past. But uh, Zoom keeps changing, and I'm going to see if Alt plus S does anything better. Uh, so Alt and S. No. I'm going to try a different um, in the gov. Let's try speaker view and see if it works better if I'm in speaker view. I think uh, that it's important that you first open uh, the link and then you share screen. You share screen. Well, I've got I've got my web page ready on my. I I'm using a Linux um, computer with. 12 virtual desktops on it. And mm -hmm. I am looking at the Zoom thing in one of these virtual desktops. And the um, the, the uh, one I want to show is uh, a different one. And I just can't get it to share the screen so that I can show it, um, which has happened to me in the past after Zoom changed something without giving any warning. Uh, but on that time, uh, I wonder what will happen if I um, yeah. move Zoom to this thing and try again. If, if, if you're new to Zoom, it's easy to skip the final step. Click on the, there should be a blue share button after you select the window. After you select the window you like, well, I've done that. Uh, I've gone to the window I want, and the share screen button is doing nothing. Um, oh. When I click on it, it's uh, something has changed. Um, uh, I wonder if it says it's recording. Um, And there's a little gear wheel there, but that doesn't give me any more options that I can use. Uh, 
Um, what happens if I go to full screen? Does that let me share the screen? Nope. Well, um, I once had this problem in the past and I dealt with it by just talking for an hour. Um, and I can hold things up in front of my camera if necessary. Uh, it's not ideal, but I think that's what I'm going to be forced to do now because otherwise we can um, spend a long time with me trying and failing to share the screen. I, all I know is that Zoom changed yesterday in, for reasons that were totally unknown to me. I mean, it had been working until the day before yesterday and something changed and I had to go around about to get back into Zoom. Um, so, uh, it's definitely recording. Well, someone's talking with a mute. I will just have to Godana. remind. You are muted. Anna, Godana was the person. Yeah, talking. I was. I was asking if you would like us to share the screen instead of you. Maybe Martin. Martin is uh, the the host. You can I, just uh, share. Okay, if you try that, let's see what happens. It, it may share his screen, not mine. But if my, if Martin allows me, uh, can say share my screen, then that should work. How are you? Can get, no, I'll be happy if I. I am not very good in this uh, because you know, like I don't have better uh, privileges than Rosanna. Rosanna, you know more maybe about this because it is hosted formally on Zoom by Dave Kelly. So uh, I don't have any yeah. uh, more privileges, like I yeah. the privileges than uh, Rosanna or someone who is. Oh, is this the screen you want to share? Uh, uh, yes. How did you do that? Uh, I opened <laughs> in the browser and opened in Zoom. Ah, so you are. I'm now looking at something I can't control. I'll have to ask you to scroll down and yeah. click on things for me yeah. well that that is slightly weird but it may work anyway um that's what you get if you use the url that i posted in in chat and um if you if you scroll down past all this text and stuff um uh we can just pause pause and um uh, I will say something about uh, what I'm trying to do, uh, uh, which is many things at once. Um, I'm very impressed by the kinds of things that uh, young children can do. Uh, and there is a video which may or may not work but we'll come back to that later. But I will, I'm also impressed by the things that newly hatched birds can do. So Gordana, there's a link there in blue, which my pointer is moving over that one. Yes, if you can, okay. So this is a snip, uh, this is from a BBC uh, Spring Watch program. Wobbly little jets are already out of their eggs. It wasn't long before all four of the chips had hatched. They were all there tumbling up. They head down to the water straight away and they start to forage. Now they won't fledge for another four to five weeks. They'll stay around the island, stay with their parents, get brooded at night. Okay, um, you can shut that down. Uh, so that that was me using a video camera in front of the BBC Springwatch thing. The whole program is on YouTube. If you look for BBC Springwatch uh, 2021, uh, I think that was episode nine or 19, anyways, the second of June. The, the main point I want to make is that those b little birds had hatched uh, a short time before you saw them. Uh, they were the mother was sitting on them after they'd hatched uh, 
she went off in one direction uh, on the left of my screen. They went in the opposite direction towards the water. And then you saw uh, one of them or a couple, and they were walking around, paddling in the water, seeing things to pick. And they had had absolutely no opportunity to learn to do any of that uh, before we saw them doing it quite expertly. So that says what in some sense we probably all knew all along uh, that what goes on inside the egg uh, gives chicks abilities to do quite complicated things that the, the, don't require any learning after hatching. Uh, of course, they go on learning and they can get better and so on. But the main point I want to make is that if we ask, well, what could go on inside the egg to produce those capabilities, then we have to ask questions about eggs. And um, uh, well, you probably all know about eggs. I have pictures and, and images which I will just leave out because you know enough. Uh, when a, an egg is first laid, um, it's enclosed in a shell, everything's protected, and there isn't very much structure. There's a portion in the center, which is the yolk, um, yellowish and all the eggs I've known about. In the middle of that, there's a tiny speck of DNA. Um, and uh, then outside it, there's other stuff, albumin and some membranes, but there's no sign of wings, bones, feathers, nerves, brains or anything else. Uh, all of that has to be assembled. And uh, I'm sure Mike knows a lot more about that than I do. But the main point I, I'm going to make now is that that assembly process, uh, I've known in a sense for years that it goes on, but I never thought until recently about the implications of what's there soon after hatching about what must have been going on in the assembly process. Now, I think a lot is known and widely known about the very earliest stages of assembly. There's this DNA molecule and it has, uh, there are mechanisms, chemical mechanisms, which uh, unzip the two strands of DNA. It's a very clever design, which enables all sorts of things to happen. Um, but from those two strands, copies are made and then new molecules are assembled and various other structures are built out of the uh, uh, chem um, uh, chemicals that are assembled and more and more of the available molecular stuff around floating around is uh, taken in and combined with this growing structure to produce ad uh, additional structures and what's happening in, in that process let's see if we can go down the screen a bit uh, go down until you see a, pi see a picture of some eggs um, Carry on a bit more. I think I had it there a bit lower down. Chick embryo development. Okay, there's a few a few images of different stages in the development of an egg, a chicken's egg, um, and you can see that uh, it's getting more and more complex structures over a period of uh, 20 days. Um, and what I'm trying to get at is that. Uh, there is a lot more than meets the eye that must be going on in the development of those structures. For, uh, there's not only the, the point that I've just made that it's producing a chick that's by the time it gets out of the egg has already got capabilities that you saw in those avocets, namely that they could go and paddle in the water and, and pick for food and so on. But there's a lot more than that going on too. There's the actual construction of a chick, which is an amazing process, much more impressive than pecking for food or anything like that. The construction of a chick, which you can only see sort of very vaguely in this thing, involves taking molecules of various, a small variety of kinds, decomposing them, reassembling all the components into a very wide variety of different sorts of molecules required for blood vessels and bones and feathers and, and skin and, and nerves and I, well, could go on for a long time. You know what I mean? Um, and so inside that egg, there's something that I would say has a complexity that is not achieved by any human design factory 
and it doesn't need any human help at all. Um, it somehow built itself. Now, part of what I want to say is that that process is not a uniform process because the more has, a, as the thing gets more complex, the problem of adding more stuff and controlling that everything goes into the right place gets more complicated. If you're growing nerve fibers uh, in a complex system, then you need complex control for the nerve fibers to go where they're intended to go. But in this system, it's not just nerve fibers, they're blood vessels and they're different sorts of blood vessels going from the heart, the, uh, the arteries going all over the place. And, and then they spread out into the capillary networks uh, in various parts of the, of the um, animal. And uh, there are veins which, uh, in which the blood flows in the opposite direction, back to the heart, also linking up with the capillary networks and um, taking the blood back. Um, but some of the blood uh, also has to go to other things in, uh, at, a, at a later stage. For example, when the um, uh, chick is breathing, uh, there's a lot of carbon dioxide that has to be got rid of through the lungs. And as you probably all know, blood vessels uh, convey the carbon dioxide to the lungs and complex things go on. Now that's not happening in the chicks yet, but the mechanisms are being assembled to make that happen. So that's an example of the intricacy of the engineering, enormously sophisticated engineering that's going on in this tiny space. Um, and in a fairly short time, now, complex engineering requires complex machinery to control what's happening. Now, there's a lot of stuff, and I think Mike knows a lot more about this than I do, and he's going to show you some of it, where biology, uh, biological organisms do their own control. They, they assemble themselves, and they change their shape, and they do all sorts of things, of which one of the best known examples is slime mold, which can find food and change its shape depending on where it finds food and 2D surface and so on. But this is far more complex than just having a kind of stuff that changes its shape. It's got to build tools. It's got to build control subsystems, which make use of information about what's been built so far and what has and hasn't been achieved. And I'm going to suggest that what is invisible in all of this is the construction of control machinery. And uh, that uh, may have a whole lot of subtlety that is uh, possibly beyond human comprehension. Uh, but I think there may be analogies with things that have happened in computer systems engineering in the last half century. Because one of the most important and spectacular things that has happened is the development of virtual machinery. Uh, now, uh, the earliest virtual machines were just a simulation of a new computer design running on an old computer to test that the simulation, the simulation test that the design of the new computer will work. But gradually, the things that could be done uh, with an existing computer to run other computations that are not uh, sort of native to that computer got more and more complicated, more and more sophisticated. And uh, the internet is a spectacular illustration of that. Uh, for example, a Zoom conference, which we're all part of now, involves, at the moment, I've lost track of the number, 30 people connected without uh, wires having to be created to connect us. Uh, a lot of physical equipment that was already in place just had uh, instructions sent to it to modify its behavior in various ways and signals are being sent in various directions uh, to, to manage various aspects of this Zoom process, including the recording that's going on at the moment and so on. So what I'm going to suggest is that the kind of virtual machinery that we have gradually invented and with a lot of struggles and a lot of uh, mistakes and so on, but it's getting, it has been getting increasingly complex over the last ha half century, um, in some sense was already invented long ago by biological evolution uh, insofar as it uh, was able to produce systems that could sit in eggs and assemble lots of components 
without taking any extra space to build the, the, the things that move other things around. It instead was only sending control signals to things that were then responding to those signals. And again, I think Mike probably knows a lot more than I do about that, but it's got quite remarkable, it must have comp remarkable properties. And the next thing I'm gonna say, which may surprise you, it surprised me when I first had the thought, is that that process of assembly gets more and more complex as the already assembled egg gets more complex. And therefore, it's likely to need a more complex controlling system to continue the later stages. So the things that are doing this virtual machine that's doing assembly of all the physical things, I'm suggesting has to in create its successor virtual machine, which will take on more complex tasks than the earlier virtual machines needed to, 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 to perform when there were fewer parts to coordinate and so on. And uh, in doing that, it almost certainly made use in subtle ways of all the things that it had already created up to that point. So my suggestion then is that uh, there is a lot of stuff going on in there that isn't understood in addition to all the stuff that is understood. And the stuff that isn't understood cannot be observed by opening up eggs and looking because it's not going to be physically visible in new parts. It's going to be a whole lot of signaling, uh, maybe electrical signals, chemical signals, and combinations of those things in ways that exist alongside what's already been assembled and what's going to be assembled. And that's a bit like, only much more complicated than, the internet setting up a Zoom uh, conference without adding any new wires or, or building any new screens or whatever. It's just in some way reusing things that are already there, connecting up virtually in new ways. Anyway, in some sense, that is the most important single point uh, that I have learned in the last six or seven months by thinking about both Zoom conferences, but more importantly, thinking about eggs and looking at videos of what young animals do when they come out of eggs. Um, now I want to relate this to some other stuff. So perhaps we can scroll down a bit, Gordana, uh, if you don't mind, and uh, carry on, carry on, I'll uh, pause. Right, uh, I'm going to, um, uh, you, you've gone past the point, but I remember what it was. Uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about information. And this conference has had a lot said about information. It's okay, don't worry about it. Um, uh, and w one of the points I want to make, uh, which is sort of obvious to many people, but it's often forgotten in the context when it's relevant, is that there's a new concept of information. It goes back less than a century. Uh, which is Shannon information, which is uh, concerned with a, a numerical measure and has to do with properties of information bearing substructures. Structures, And there's a much older concept of information, which has to, which we can think of as some semantic content. content. And on one of my websites, I have collected a, a whole lot of um, sentences from Jane Austen's novel, Pride and Prejudice, written over a hundred years before Shannon, in which she used the information. And this is so-and-so, with this information was able to do so-and-so. Now, what Jane Austen was talking about was not a collection of bit patterns. She wasn't even talking about a collection of sentences or whatever. She was talking about information content that a semantic content, we might say in modern jargon, that her, her in, uh, her characters in the novels made use of and sometimes transmitted to others and sometimes concealed and so on. But anyway, Jane Austen wasn't alone in this. this she was just using a way of thinking about information and what you can do with it that everybody knew and we all know. But somehow when we get into scientific and engineering modes, we forget all that and think information is Shannon information.
which it isn't. And by the way, Shannon understood this very well. I believe I've read somewhere that he was reluctant to use the word information for what he was talking about. He would rather have invented a new concept, but he was employed by Bell Labs. And I think they were selling telephone networks and, and they wanted to talk about their information systems. And I think that produced some pressure on Shannon to do something which he was reluctant to do. That's gossip that I picked up somewhere and I don't remember where, but um, uh, it fits my view of the intelligence of Shannon. Unfortunately, many of his readers are not so intelligent and they take his use of the word information to exclude other uses and they say and they think as if he has somehow told us what information really was all along which is not what he tried to do and not what he did he told us stuff about information bearers information manipulators and other things and their properties okay so that's a, a second uh, important point which is in some ways marginal uh, but it's uh, relevant to the conference which is all about information so let's go down some more. Um, you can see I've got a thing there saying not Shannon information. And uh, if you pause, uh, Alan Turing is mentioned. And um, the reason for that is that um, partly as, as an indirect result of Gordana once asking me to contribute a, a paper to an, uh, a book she was editing, uh, which she did. And then later she asked me to talk to um, another contributor, uh, which I did. Uh, and he later asked me to contribute, um, Bob, what's his name? Uh, anyway. anyway, it's not important. Um, he Cooper. asked, that's right, Bob Cooper. Cooper. Cooper? I died a few times. Yes. Uh, and as a result of that, he later asked me to contribute to a book he was editing, co editing about Alan Turing for the Alan Turing centenary, and it was published uh, uh, a couple of, about a year after the, a year or two after the centenary. And as a result of that, I discovered Turing's paper on morphogenesis. I don't know how many in this audience will learn that paper. It was the chemical basis of morphogenesis published in 1952. And it is all about two dimensional patterns that can form on surfaces of objects if you have molecules that move around on the surface and interact in various ways. Um, there's a lot of excite uh, inhibition and stimulation going on and uh, Turing somehow uh, stumbled across that. Uh, I say stumbled because I don't think that was what he was really interested in. And he, he discovered it had nice mathematical properties. And he wrote this remarkable paper, which has influenced lots of people, although most philosophers you know, uh, and people who think about Turing in terms of intelligence don't know much about that paper. Uh, probably people in this audience do know about it. Anyway, I, I looked at this paper and I read what he was saying about these 2D patterns forming and the complexities uh, and the, how you can get different patterns. And I thought, why was Alan Turing doing that? And then something at the back of my brain said, he said something about chemistry in the mind paper in 1950. So I went and looked and searched. And sure enough, there's a sentence there which says something like, uh, chemistry is at least as important as electricity in brains, but he didn't say why. So I then started thinking, what's going on here? Turing has a theory about chemistry being important in brains. Probably he is beginning to develop his ideas about in what way it's important and how chemical information processing plays a role alongside electrical information. And then he discovers as a side effect that chemical processes can form these 2D patterns and thinks, oh, I'll write a paper on that. And that's what he's known for. But I think he died before he finished the work he really wanted to do, which was the stuff about chemistry in brains. That's my guess. And uh, there's a lot of unpublished stuff and handwritten notes about Turing, which has turned up recently. And maybe if that ever gets transcribed and published, we will either find clear evidence that I'm completely wrong or the opposite. Um, anyway, so that's a point about Turing 
and uh, it supports the general point insofar as it seems likely, given everything we know about Turing, that he may have started to think about the kinds of chemistry-based information processing that's required for assembly of animals in eggs or in, you know, not just in eggshells, but in uh, mammals and others as well. But I don't know. Anyway, that's uh, a, a sort of a bit of historical gossip that, that uh, there's a possibility that Turing has already done, uh, had already done before when he died, uh, what I've been struggling to do, and if so, Turing had probably done it much better, but we'll never know. Anyway, so let's go on a bit more uh, down the page, slowly, and I'll uh, evolving concept of virtual machine. Well, I've mentioned that, so we can go on past that. And how's the assembly process? We can go on past that and go on past the chicks. And we can pause now at these rings. Now, another strand in all of this which I mentioned briefly earlier, um, is that, uh, which I'll say a bit more now, uh, I got into philosophy because I was uh, interested in uh, philosophy of mathematics. And I got into philosophy of mathematics because I had been a mathematics student. Uh, and um, uh, one of the things that I really liked about mathematics was geometry. And I was taught geometry at school, which they used to do when I was a kid in the early 1950s, where we were taught to uh, uh, create uh, con uh, uh, construction processes using ruler and compasses, as Euclid had described, and then to find proofs. Uh, for instance, if you can find a construction to do something, you might want to prove that it will do it under all conditions, or you might find a proof that something cannot be done, or you can might find a proof that some complex process of construction achieves what it was meant to do. Now, I had planned to do something which I think I can't do now, but I will talk about doing it. Um, if you draw a triangle on a sketch pad of some sort, uh, you can draw a line, straight line. So we have this planar triangle. You can draw a straight line that goes through one side of the triangle and then past the opposite corner of the triangle. So if you then move that corner onto that line and move it away from the opposite side, you've got a triangle and uh, it's got these three sides and the triangle is changing its shape and the point is moving along this line. And I will say to you that angle will get bigger or smaller. Which does it do? The angle that moves along the line, does it get bigger or smaller? You find it obvious that if the bottom part of the triangle stays fixed, straight line goes through that and you move the third uh, point of the triangle along the line, the point, the angle there will get smaller as it moves further away and if you move it down. And it doesn't matter at what angle you draw the line, you can draw another line at a different angle going through the base, bring that point onto that line and move it further away. The line will get smaller, bring it back, the line will get bigger. Now, you can prove that using Euclid's formulations and constructions, although it's not one of Euclid's theorems because he didn't have theorems quite like that. But what I'm going to say now is that there are things about human brains that enable us to think about such geometric structures and processes and discover things that are necessarily the case or equivalently are impossible, equivalently because if something's necessarily the case, the opposite's impossible and vice versa. And I suggest that long before Euclid organized or collected his axioms and whatever, uh, and long before the people who are famous for finding theorems like Pythagoras, who produced a theorem about triangles, there were people uh, for, and there's a lot of evidence for this uh, in uh, China and India and other places, Babylonian, uh, hundreds of years before, who had made a lot of those discoveries in contexts that might have been related just to, uh, to uh, exploring uh, geometric structures and shapes 
or more likely originally because they had practical applications. One that's often talked about is uh, dealing with um, market, uh, where field boundaries after the flood to the Nile, but I don't know whether to believe that or not. But they built in tremendously complex pyramids and uh, had to do a lot of engineering to do that. And then had to reason about building things to carry heavy blocks around and making cranes and so on. So my guess is they were doing sophisticated spatial reasoning, making use of this ability to think about structures and process and realize that if something happens to a structure, then something else necessarily happens to it. The opposite is impossible or to discover that something is impossible with a particular configuration. Now, how were their brains doing that? Um, a lot of people would now say, oh, they've got neural nets, they learned. But neural nets, as currently understood, are constitutionally in incapable of discovering that something is impossible or that something is necessarily true. That's because neural nets, unless they have extra apparatus, collects lots of statistics and then they derive probabilities from those statistics. And impossibility is not a degree of probability. And necessity is not a degree of probability. They're not zero and 100. They're something in a different space entirely. So the neural nets cannot produce proofs in the sense that mathematicians have proofs. They can do something different uh, and not very well either. But that's another story. Um, so that's part of this background um, because uh, I um, had discovered that there were a lot of people when I was a graduate student um, and uh, in mathematics and going to philosophy meetings and getting friendly with philosophy, I found philosophers who thought that Immanuel Kant had been wrong about mathematics and when I read a bit more about this, I found that what Kant had said conformed to my personal experience of doing mathematics. And what I believe was the personal experience of those ancient mathematicians too, namely that they could perform constructions which enable them to discover things that are impossible or necessarily the case. But uh, when I was a student, th this was around about 1959, 60, um, things had happened. Einstein had produced a general theory of relativity, which suggested that space is not Euclidean. Uh, Eddington and other people had set up the uh, experiments, uh, were tracing light passing uh, the sun, confirming Einstein's predictions, showing space was curved. And everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people had concluded as a result of that and other things, the development of formal logical techniques by uh, Frege and, and uh, Russell and uh, stuff by Piano and lots of other people, that all this stuff about humans thinking about spatial structures and reasoning about geometric shapes is not what real mathematics is about. The real mathematics involves formal operations on symbolic structures. And anyway, the, the kind of reasoning that Immanuel Kant had talked about doesn't work because it reaches false conclusions. And I thought, this is completely wrong. Um, what, what the uh, people who had discovered that there are non-Euclidean spaces and physical spaces was, was not Euclidean, no more to my mind, refuted the ancient discoveries about Euclidean planes, then finding structures on the surface of a teapot refutes the ancient discoveries. And I'm sure the ancient geometricians would have laughed if you'd said, look, here on a teapot, I can draw something and your theorems are no longer true. They say, so what? My theorems are not about that kind of surface. And likewise, we can say our ancient geometrical Euclidean theorems are not about the kind of physical space, which it turns out isn't Euclidean, although that wasn't known at the time. So I thought, well, I'll switch from philosophy, from mathematics to philosophy and try to make that point and um, convince, convince everybody that Kant was right. Although he didn't, he said uh, he could not explain how human brains did this 
kind of discovery about impossibility and necessity. He had a, a striking phrase uh, he, that he thought it would be a, an art that lies forever concealed in the depths of the human soul. That's a translation, of course, he, he wrote in German. But he, he thought that somehow we'd never be able to understand it. And he was sort of right. It's very difficult to understand. And we haven't got there yet. And all of this that I'm talking about is part of a process of maybe one day leading to a proper understanding of it. Anyway, what are these rings about? Well, they're just an example. If I ask you, uh, suppose each ring had been carved out of a, a lump of rock or stone, could they have been put together like that afterwards? And I think you will probably agree that that's impossible. They must have been carved out of a single lump of rock, even though that's not obvious. Well, I leave you to think more about that, and you may want to raise some objections later. But part of the point I'm making is that these things that, that Kant was talking about and that I'm talking about are part of a lot of everyday spatial interaction. If you've got a table, you want to get it out, or a chair, you want to get it out through a door, and in its normal orientation, it just can't get through the door. If you think a bit, you realize that if you turn it on its edge, you can then have its legs sticking horizontally. Then you can put two of the eggs through the door. Sorry, not eggs, legs through the door, and then swivel it around and so on, and you'll be able to get it out and then put it back into its original position. So you can think about what is and isn't possible and solve practical problems that way. And it's not only mathematicians and engineers who do that, that lots of people have this ability and they use the, the abilities, but they don't notice the sophistication of what they're doing. And also the neuroscientists don't notice the incapability of neural nets as they think of neural nets, the statistics and probabilistic machines, they are incapable of doing, of explaining the reasoning processes that involve grasping and understanding impossibilities and necessities in practical life, let alone building pyramids and other complex engineering problems. Okay, so let's go down a bit more. Uh, there are lots and lots of examples that I've collected all over the place uh, all right, yes, if you pause just a moment, um, I won't go into any details, but I'll just mention that you can have fun thinking about curves, closed curves on a torus, and I've drawn some there. And um, if you think about deforming a curve by sliding it around in the surface of the torus, you can ask questions like, can one of these curves be continuously deformed into another? And you can see there are uh, two yellow curves, I think there are, and a couple of blue ones. And uh, if I ask you if one of the, the yellow ones, so the one called Y2, can be continuously deformed in that surface into the blue, blue curve, which is labeled B1, um, well, I'll leave you to think about it. Uh, the, and the, you can have fun, as I once did for a couple of days, asking yourself, how many equivalence classes of continuous closed curves are there on the surface of a torus? Because you'll soon discover that there are some curves that can be continuously deformed into each other, or some pairs of curves, and some that can't. And then you, then you can explore it. Now, human brains can do that sort of thing. And, and I'm trying to understand how, and I think this is related to the intelligence of many other animals. The difference in humans is that we not only do it, but we can notice ourselves doing it, and we can reflect on it, and we can teach others to do it, and so on. Carry on down. Uh, and a bit more, oh yes, so if you pause there, I've got some links to, uh, okay, stop there. You've, you've passed some links that are in the website to some very nice lectures online, some brilliant lectures in geometry, old style geometric geometry using diagrams and so on. Anyway, here are Hume and Kant, Hume on the left, Kant on the right. And uh, I mentioned what Kant had said, and he said what he did in reaction against what David Hume had written. Um, Hume was very clever, of course, uh, but I think uh, he may have got something wrong because he wrote as if there were just two kinds of knowledge. 
uh, and the one kind he called relations between ideas and the other kind he called matters of fact or something like that I can't remember the exact wording and uh, he thought that the relations between ideas are things you can discover simply by manipulating definitions now he didn't say that but that's how I interpret his words and that's how Kant interpreted his words that there are things you can learn by taking definitions and using logical deduction from your definitions and then there are other things that you can't learn that way and Kant said uh, those things you have to learn by measuring and observing and so on and anything else, and by anything else, I think he was thinking of theological statements, uh, anything else is sophistry and illusion and should be consigned to the flames. In other words, the theology books should be burnt, uh, with which I have some sympathy, lots of sympathy. So Kant read all that, and he was, he said, awoken from his dogmatic slumbers by thinking about what Hume had written, that there's just these two kinds of knowledge. And Kant thought, no, there's something in between. There is the kind of knowledge that I've just been talking about, where you can make discoveries by reasoning about spatial structures and so on. And you're not just using definitions and so on. And there is knowledge that you can use of the sort that Hume seems to have been talking about, where you take definitions and you analyze them and you work out the consequences of those definitions. And there is, as Hume said, also stuff that you've got to go and measure and observe the empirical knowledge. But the stuff in between those two, Kant claimed Hume had not noticed, and maybe Hume hadn't noticed, or if, if he'd been asked, he would have said, oh yes, of course, I should have mentioned that, because he is so clever. I'm sure he knew about geometry. And if he'd thought for a few minutes, he'd have realized it does, doesn't fit the definition that would apply to, for instance, the statement, uh, well, I'll ask you, leave you, give you the question. Um, can an unmarried uncle be an only child? You can write that down and think about it later. We haven't got time now. But you, if you work out the answer to that, you'll see that it's on one side of Hume's position, not the other. Anyway, so part of what I'm doing this for is that I think um, there is a that, that's that part of one of the things that Kant said was that what he was talking about was very difficult to explain. And there's a phrase, I don't know if I've already mentioned this, that which is translated as this will this is an art that will be forever concealed in the depths of the human soul. He was trying to understand how we can make these discoveries about impossibility and necessity and so on. And finding it very difficult. Anyway, I'm beginning to run out of time, I see. So uh, if we go on down a bit more, um, I think Kant was right. And I think he would have liked the kind of thing that we're now talking about as possibly coming out of chemical processes, which can do forms of reasoning that he hadn't thought about. Uh, carry on up, we can skip uh, and some more. Um, right, construction kits. Um, if you pause, uh, no, carry on. I want to see, have the next diagram coming up. Okay, if you pause now. Um, I had I hoped to get here a bit earlier, but I will try to go through this fairly quickly. Um, this came out of interaction uh, about 2004 when with a biologist whom I think I may have mentioned earlier, Jackie Chappell, who's in the School of Biosciences in Birmingham. Um, she was concerned with some observations on crows in Oxford. Uh, in fact, there were two crows that she fetched from New Caledonia, it's an island near New Zealand, and brought back to Oxford and did some experiments. And one of those crows was called Betty, who became very famous in 2002 because she uh, solved a problem uh, that had been set up for two crows, Betty and Abel, which involved a tube, a vertical tube, glass tube with some food in the bottom. Does anyone remember this? It was very famous for a while. Um, and um, the uh, birds, 
the male and female crows could come and see this food uh, in a bucket at the bottom of a tube, but they couldn't reach the bucket with their beaks. And the um, uh, experimenters had put a piece of wire on a table, a piece of wire with hook on the end, and uh, uh, each of these birds, when given this challenge to get the food, had uh, seen the wire, gone and got the wire, come back to the tube, push the wire down, hook the, the wire around the bucket, put it out, and then uh, uh, eaten the food. On one occasion, they forgot to remove, they for, for the, the, the uh, male had removed the piece of wire that was bent in a hook. He flew off with it. And then they brought in Betty and they put the bucket with the food in and, and left her. And she looked around for the hook and it wasn't there. But there were some straight pieces of wire. So she got one of them. And she, I, I can't remember which one she did first, but they later discovered that she could bend that piece of wire in several different ways. One of them was to stick the end of the wire into the ducting tape that was holding the tube in place, stick it in, press it in, and then pull one end round. Another way was to fly up to uh, a peg sticking out of the wall with a hole next to it, poke the wire into the hole while she's sitting the peg, bend the wire back, and get a, a made a hook. Another way, she flew up to a railing and uh, bent down, and with her one with the wire in her mouth, uh, made it lie along the rail. Then, with one of her claws, clamped the wire onto the rail, and then she pulled the end of the hook up with her mouth, and um, then went back and got the food out. So, what that shows is not only could she make a hook out of a straight piece of wire, she could do it in more than one way. And she wasn't satisfied with just doing it in one way. She was sort of programmed, had, once she discovered this kind of thing, to explore different ways to do it. Anyway, that's part of the pr product of biological evolution that goes way beyond anything any neuroscientist I know about is anywhere close to explaining uh, what goes on in Betty's brain in, in, a, in a situation like that. Um, anyway, um, most people uh, hadn't noticed that Betty had done this remarkable thing uh, or they hadn't thought about it. But Jackie and I started talking about it. And then as a result of our long conversations, we came up with this thing, which I'm going to have to skip through very quickly because I'm totally out of time. Our idea was that whereas um, there's a notion of a genetic landscape, epigenetic landscape of Waddington, where you have things rolling down and, uh, and being diverted. Uh, we came up with this thing that we call the meta-configured genome. And the idea is that an animal is born with a genetic apparatus, which has multiple levels, which get uh, uh, expressed at different times. And whenever a new collection of genes is expressed, that is used to do something that wasn't done before, the results are stored. And then there, those records are later used when another layer of genetic information is expressed and it is not just fed down into behavior. It's combined with what was there before to instantiate that. And this cycling goes on. And this happens over uh, uh, many uh, years in the case of humans and not so many years in others. And I'm suggesting that that involves, is going to involve a lot of chemical processing of kinds that nobody understands. And I'm sorry I've gone on too long. But at that point, I think I've probably given you indigestion and I should stop anyway. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, you are just in time because I took a little time in the beginning for the introduction. Thank you very much.